When this happened, well, didn't have anything. So, God, the teaching come back. I watched the animals, see what they ate, drunk. I've done that. But in the jungle, I knew where I was. I could see things, hear things, even smell things, you know. And the biggest part that I thought was contributed was from some of my grandmother's teaching. The suicide plane hit us in the, in the fantail, and uh, I was about from here to that wall on a 40, 40 millimeter. I was a loader, and it come and just took the whole back side of it. And I was about that far from that wall over there, and, and took uh, the whole fantail. You know, it's just part of being Comanche, who we are as warriors and uh, men and women. A long time ago, they grew up to be warriors. They grew up learning to ride, uh, to, uh, to use their weaponry. It was our way of life for our men to defend uh, the nation. And that's whenever the understanding of the uh, warrior ethos and the Comanche tribe started to take its place and, and you know, basically choose me down my path of which where I was going to go. There are nearly 160,000 American Indian veterans living in the United States today. Proportionately, they represent a military enlistment rate that is three times higher than any other non-Indian group. Most have served because of the long-honored tradition of defending their homeland, the warrior tradition. Historically, at the core of Comanche tribal life was the way of the warrior. The warrior protected the community. The warrior provided food for his family and community. A young warrior might begin his training and go on his first raid at the age of 11 or 12. They would teach him how to ride a horse, and most kids grew up on a horse already, so it was like, you know, just second nature, really. From birth, you learned how to ride, you learned how to use your weapons, whether it's a bow and arrow, a rifle, a pistol, a, a lance, a spear, a hatchet, tomahawk, or whatever. It was very important to the individual to have some form of standing, uh, and, and that was based heavily on either warfare or the hunt. The hunt, likewise, was just as important to demonstrate your abilities as a warrior. That tradition of the warrior of course, was the lifeblood of the tribe and of the, the family. The stories of our ancestors and their, their, their the war prowess is, is hard to beat. And, and that's not, uh, let it be said that that just not, is not just a man's responsibility. It's a woman's responsibility too. Traditionally, you know, a long time ago, um, there were women also that went into battle with the men. It wasn't always just men. Our grandfather is Chief White Wolf. Um, his wife was Sanapia, who was a um, medicine woman. And she went to battle alongside her husband, White Wolf. And uh, so I know that my grandmother was a woman warrior. Comanches were, were ambushed. I think the area was somewhere around Rush Springs, Oklahoma. She got up in, on the horse, and when she did, she r rode through the line that uh, where the two were fighting, the Spanish and, and uh, the soldiers from 
I, I would imagine Fort Sill, but she rode through that line and hollering. She managed to take a couple of, couple of soldiers, killed them outright, and then she, that didn't stop her. So she turned around and come back, come back to the same area, the same line, still, still hollering. She was, she was a warrior, she said. I'm a warrior and I'm helping my people. They gave her a name at that, at that time. The name was Puhawaki. Puhawaki is a medicine woman hollering. Even the story of how um, the Comanche women got what they call the Kapitaki or the Lulu, even that story itself talks about, you know, the uh, warrior element in the women. It's like that came to us when um, another group of Indians had attacked a small group of women. And there was this one tall, thin Comanche woman that was just so overwhelmed by it when the man came up on her on the horse, then she just opened her mouth and that's what came out. And so that's the story of how the women got that warrior cry. Uh, there was always a threat. Uh, initially, it was a threat from other tribes. Always fought other tribes. Uh, the Dewey uh, is the bird, the black bird, and this military society mimics the crow. Like if they're facing the enemy, they would hop out two or three steps and they would retreat. They would do that again and retreat. Then after a period of time, they would, it had to be the right moment when they would attack, but they could not retreat after that they would fight to the death. That's exactly what a Pukutsi is. They would be the first to fight the enemy. And it would be known, and the history has proven, that the Comanche warrior would, would fight to the death. And you've heard other tribes say it's a good day to die, but a hand-to-hand -hand combat is exactly what this person is. They say they would call them the contraries because there's no way that you could calm them, no way you could reason with them, no way that you can uh, 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 try to get them to calm their anxieties because they're warriors. And even to this day, there's a lot of people that won't fight a Comanche because he'll get back up. You have to kill him. That's, that's the ultimate. So we always had an enemy, and our enemy finally disappeared uh, basically in 1875. Great honor has always been given to the warrior. Ceremonies honoring warriors have been an important part of nearly all important social and cultural gatherings. When they came home when nobody hurt or anything, well, they had the dance to honor. And there used to be one special warrior that was outstanding. And in that event, well, they had the scalp dance and then the family of this brave, extra brave warrior, his family would have a teepee set up and all of his family would put gifts inside of this teepee. Little ponies were our prime warriors, the ones that did the fighting. When you got too old to be a little pony or a little horse, you became part of the big horse society. These are the ones that had uh, too old to fight too old to fight, age, wounds, or whatever. And they were the ones who taught the young ones how to become little ponies. They're the ones who made the bow and arrow. They're the ones that show them how to shoot the weapons, how to use a knife, how to use a hatchet, and things like that. They pretty much were the individuals who had, have already been through the, the warfare, and they had knowledge of, of the terrain, they had knowledge of the weather, they had knowledge of, of plants, they didn't have knowledge of water. Traditional war dance gatherings like the gourd dance and the buffalo dance represented various stages of preparation for military conflict and honored past military achievements. The establishment of reservations by the federal government radically changed all aspects of Comanche life. With the confiscation of all weapons and shields, Comanche men no longer had the means of achieving warrior status. This sort of was the beginning of the end, if you will, of the warrior tradition. But once the buffalo began to decline in huge numbers, uh, by 1876 in the southern plains there were very few buffalo left. Uh, 
held on in the northern plains for another 10 years perhaps, but by the mid-1880s they were about gone from the northern plains. This pretty well took away that hunt element from the warrior tradition. No longer being able to go to Texas and Mexico to raid and take captives and take horses, uh, then there was very little left for the men to uh, demonstrate their abilities to earn their position in the uh, societies, the war societies, and the war societies themselves began to disappear and, and sort of uh, come unraveled. The government was really pretty tricky, the U.S. government was pretty tricky because they realized that there was no way they was ever going to be able to take the land from the Comanche people. So that's when they developed that 1830 Indian Removal Act policy. And what that did was it forced other tribes that weren't from the area into this region. And what it did was it pitted Indian against Indian. So their idea was instead of, you know, them fighting against the Comanches, they would have the other tribes fight. So that's really how the U.S. ended up gaining foothold and control over, you know, Comanche country. The Comanche and other tribes were forced to become dependent on meager rations from the government. Um, the adjustments were difficult. Uh, their agencies had a responsibility for providing beef, beef on the hoof. And it was an issue day, once a month was a big event. Uh, the cattle were brought in to uh, the issue pens just a uh, short distance east here along East Cache Creek. And once a month, all the people gathered. The head men of the family were um, now had a right, had a, a, an ability to hunt these steers uh, in the old way. So uh, when their name was called out, and the agent or the deputy marshals, the Indian police uh, would open the gates, and the steers would rush out and race across the prairie. Uh, the individual would chase those steers on horseback, shoot them with the uh, bows and arrows or rifles, whichever they, they had, and the women would then move in to proceed with the butchering and the processing of the hides and everything about the uh, steers, as they had done with the buffalo in the, in the previous time period. It was a substitute for the buffalo, and yet it enabled that warrior tradition to sort of carry on in a somewhat different way, but yet very similar. However, just to indicate the cultural differences that existed, the officers' wives at Fort Sill felt that this uh, chasing of these steers and shooting them uh, at, and running for a half mile, a mile or so, and then uh, doing the, all the processing was barbaric. In time, they stopped doing the, the uh, issue on the hoof and began butchering the beef in advance and then giving the tribal members tokens, brass tokens, about the size of a silver dollar that would be stamped good for one pound, five pound, 10 pound, 20 pound, 50 pounds beef. Now from the white man's perspective, that was good. They were saving the Indians all that trouble. They have to chase those steers down the valley and shoot them and kill them and butcher them and process them. But in unknowingly, they were taking away that last vestige of the hunt, which was so important to the warrior society. Due to poor nutrition and increasing disease, the Comanche population declined from 40,000 in the early 1780s to only 1,409 by 1901. During this time, the government provided one physician for 4,000 Indians living on several reservations. For 50 years, the death rate of American Indians exceeded the birth rate. The diseases took a big toll on us. A heavy toll, for example, the big thing that took um, members of my family was tuberculosis. See, we didn't live in uh, houses. We lived in the open. Our air was pure, our water was clean, and we were not confined in a place like in a house. So when you live in close quarters, you just, uh, you're breathing each other's germs. To make matters even worse, in 1887, Congress passed the Dawes Act, also known as the Allotment Act. The act was nothing more than a legal way to grab Indian lands. Under the act, each individual Indian family was allotted 160 acres to farm. The surplus land was then opened up to settlement. Non-Indians streamed into Comanche lands. 
50,000 showed up before the legislation was even enacted. With them came loan sharks and con artists. In 1905, a Godabo banker was charged with fraud after assessing Indians interest rates of up to 3,360% and then foreclosing on the loans to grab their lands. Indian trust lands in Oklahoma decreased from 41 million acres before the Dawes Act to 2.9 million acres by 1930. On the Comanche land base, whites now outnumbered Indians 33 to 1. The Comanche lost most of their land base and families were forced to rely almost entirely on subsistence lifestyle. There was no employment. Some had a few chickens or cattle. Others grew vegetable gardens. Each family shared what they had with the community and they all experienced times of hunger. Whenever the people would uh, butcher, they all welcome. Anybody's welcome. Anybody come there, they welcome to get some of the beef. And that's different now. You can't hardly do that anymore. Circumstances were extremely difficult, but as a community, their inner strength and dignity never faltered. The history there, the strength of the Comanche is phenomenal. We survived a true holocaust. Comanches were able to once again achieve warrior status when the U.S. Cavalry enlisted them as 7th Cavalry Scouts in 1878. In this role they were used primarily as peacekeepers in Indian country. The Cavalry then established all Indian military units in 1890. Troop L of the 7th Cavalry was established at Fort Sill and was composed of Kiowas, Comanches, and Chiricahua Apaches. Eighteen Comanches served from 1892 to 1897. When these units were disbanded, Comanche warriors were once again left without a means of achieving their traditional status. Despite the many hardships and poor treatment at the hands of the federal government and settlers, the nation was surprised by the willingness of American Indians to heed the call to enlist in World War I. Fifty-eight Comanches served in World War I. During World War I, my great uncle, you know, who raised my dad, uh, Lawrence Thomas Sr., he wasn't even an American citizen, and he went, he fought went fought in World War I, and there's numerous, numerous other Comanche warriors, Comanche citizens who, who fought in World War I, and they weren't even American citizens, so how can you explain that? One of our Comanches was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest award for uh, gallantry in action. He was also awarded the Silver Star Medal. His name was Calvin Atovich, and uh, he passed away in 1950 and he was also a, uh, a leader of our early Comanche government. Nearly 12,000 American Indian men enlisted in the armed forces. With the warrior tradition nearly disappearing at the beginning of the reservation period during these tremendously difficult times of adjustment, that the military became the substitute. It was a new way to achieve the same goal, to achieve manhood, to achieve rank and status within their respective uh, groups, their families, their tribes, uh, by becoming a warrior in the military. It was our way of life for our men to defend uh, the nation. So I think it was uh, part of their thought as warriors to, they saw that as a way to continue to protect us and also on a larger scale to protect the uh, United States citizens. I don't think, uh, for example, I don't think the Comanches ever lost sight of the fact of the matter, this is their land. Others felt like it was their obligation because we as Comanches were very proud of what we have. The old folks would tell you, Get that nasuad. Don't get shame. 
of what you have. She said, the good Lord gave that to you. My mommy silk, you take care of it. You treat it good. This sukkah that we got, this land, take care of it. Don't let nobody take it from you. American Indians played an important role in battlefield communications in World War I. The U.S. military realized that unique tribal languages could be used as a code in battle to transmit vital information between the troops in the front lines and their officers to the rear. With one tribal member on each end of the communications line, they could speak in their own language, and there was no need for time-consuming deciphering of information. The Choctaw were the primary group used, but several Comanches also served as code talkers in World War I. Their traditional languages proved to be an unbreakable code. This system was kept secret even after the war, and the military was able to use the technique in World War II with other tribal languages. When the Comanche veterans returned from war, there was a spontaneous return to the traditional ceremonies honoring the victorious warriors. But they all came back. And in the Comanche flag song, uh, it says, Sima Koyama, it says, they all came back, they all returned. And uh, it's, that's, that's the, it's, it's like the national anthem to us. This return to tradition was not a welcome turn of events for the U.S. Indian Service, who had been trying to eradicate all Indian traditions. In 1914, the Indian Commissioner sent out a directive reiterating the official government policy prohibiting dancing. He said, both the Indians and the public should be made to realize that these old customs retard the march of civilization and that the government looks with disfavor on all appeals that mean perpetuating them. This policy was part of a concerted effort by the federal government to assimilate American Indians into the larger American society, which was already a melting pot of many cultures. The first step in the assimilation process was education. Indian boarding schools were built. Children were taught to speak English, but were discouraged from speaking their tribal languages. Some were even severely punished for speaking Indian. The irony of this was the fact that Indian languages played such an important role in winning two major wars. Fourteen Comanches served as code talkers in World War II. They'd been recruited for this assignment as early as December of 1940, a full year before Pearl Harbor and 16 months before any Navajos were recruited. Their assignment was to develop a Comanche language-based communication system that could be used in battle. We work on that language deal to make it perfect. And the Navajos did the same thing we did or we did what they did. They had to improvise different words too like we did. In the Comanche language there's no such word as a tank or an airplane or a gun. A gun in the Comanche language is just a gun, period. They call it cowboy. A bomber became a pregnant airplane and a turtle became a tank. And the sewing machine gun cowboy became a machine gun. We went in D plus one, and uh, I saw uh, one of those landing crafts blowed all to pieces, and saw bodies laying around, and that still didn't soak in, you know. Comanche code talkers continued to serve from D-Day to the war's end in 1945. You know, after you're there a while, you can tell the way the shell is screaming, it's whether it's going to be closed or over you or short, you know. So I took off running to the hedgerow. I just dove in that hedgerow and uh, I laid on my back, pitch black. Next morning I woke up about daylight and I looked across from me. There said a German soldier, he had his rifle across his lap 
You know how you first wake up, you don't know what to think. I said, is this real or what? So it seemed like I laid there looking at him for two or three minutes, probably two or three seconds. I said, well, I gotta do something. So I grabbed my gun and pointed at him. He never moved. So I walked away and looked at him and he was dead and his eyes were wide open. And uh, I guess that was the fastest I ever run. I jumped out of there and run to the, find my other buddies. So I made a joke out of it later. I said, I, said, I got you guys beat. I said, how's that? I said, I slept with our enemy all night long and didn't even know it. Code talkers today, I knew them as the Fourth Signal Corps. And they were just all family. Most of them were all family from Cotton County. Nearly every one of those being that they call the now the elite coat talkers, mm -hmm. they were all from Cotton County. Mm -hmm. There's about six of them that are my, all my cousins. Mm -hmm. He would talk about it, but not unless I asked him. It just really, I became really, really fascinated. And uh, he, uh, you know, he told me he, he did. He, you know, they uh, captured a German Tiger tank. He showed me the belt buckle. I, I believe he's uh, still have and that. My dad was very uh, proficient in the English language, and he was very proficient in the Comanche language. And because of that, that were that those were the skills that uh, helped him to be an excellent uh, soldier and a code talker. In 2008, the Comanche code talkers received the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor for their invaluable contributions to winning the war. For the Comanche Nation, World War II was a significant turning point, both from a cultural and economic standpoint. 186 Comanches served with the armed forces, and many other tribal members participated in the war effort by working in war-related industries. For many, these wartime jobs would lead to later full-time employment after the war. George Asa Permi Sr was not able to serve in the military because he had six children, but like many other Comanche men and women, was still able to contribute to the war effort. Uh, went to uh, Wichita, Kansas, to uh, uh, the school that they had there, uh, that uh, Boeing was uh, sponsoring, a uh, welding. Uh, after he finished that, well, he went back home and he went to work at the Douglas Aircraft in Oklahoma City. And uh, mom and dad and the kids moved to Mustang. The community gathered together to send their young men and women off to war and also supported them in prayer. And they, the, he was leaving and they were, all the people were there. See, they all stick together. The old people, they stick together when they're praying, you know, and saying, and uh, when he was leaving, they were praying there and saying him there. And uh, I remember the song that they were singing when the, he was leaving. And they would ask him, you know, son, he's gone, he went to, went to war. Let's remember him in prayer. And they would sit and they would pray. Sometimes they'd be on the street and they would pray for them. He's left, he's such a young man, you know, he's the only son I got and he's gone. And they would pray. They, they, they uh, really had a lot of value for our veterans. We want to see y'all over here. All Indian boys come over here. So we did. We went over there and, and it was my mom. She, she told us, she said, that we've been praying for you while you were gone. We prayed for you when we left. Now we're going to pray for you since you're home. My dad, a lot of times, would be sitting and listen to our radio. We had this radio and it had a big old battery. You wouldn't believe, look like a car battery. And that was the end of the world if that battery ever went out. Well, I remember my dad sitting there intently and listening to the news. I guess he knew what uh, his son was going through. Comanches served honorably in all branches of the service and at all levels. Several received commissions as officers and many advanced to the highest non-commissioned ranks. He was in New Guinea. Well, we chased the enemy up in the mountains. And our leader, the lieutenant and, and the sergeant, while well, they were, they stepped on the mine. They knocked everything out. Here we were. We stayed out there almost a little over a week. When this happened, we well, didn't have anything. 
their teaching come back to me. I watched the animals, see what they ate, drunk. I've done that. And I told the rest of the crew, they start doing that. We survived for a week. A suicide plane hit us in the, in the fantail, and uh, I was about from here, that wall, on a 40, 40 millimeter. I was a loader, and it come and just took the whole back side of it. And I was about that far from that wall over there, and, and took uh, the whole fan tail. And I was, I was, I was in the water. There was two, two more guys were with us there, and, and we was trying to hold them up. And one, one guy I had, uh, I knew him, he died, because he swallowed a lot of uh, oil and uh, diesel fuel. And we was all sick. And uh, we hung on till they come and got us. A freighter picked us up. And uh, that's a, uh, that was a scary thing. On June 6, 1944, the U.S. Armed Forces took part in the largest amphibious attack in history attacking five heavily defended beaches along the coast of France. In the darkness of the night before the coastal landings began, American and British airborne units parachuted and landed gliders behind the German beach fortifications. Their objective was to secure and seal off routes for German reinforcements. The nighttime drops did not go exactly as planned. Heavy anti-aircraft fire and flak caused the troop planes to veer off course and resulted in the troops landing miles from their intended drop zones. Corporal Johnny Rivas and Sergeant Melvin Myers were there that night with the 82nd Airborne, parachuting into France in the dark of night. Corporal Rivas's unit landed near the towns of Carentan and Cherbourg and came into immediate contact with German forces. During the first day of fierce combat, Corporal Rivas was killed by a direct hit from a German artillery shell. Sergeant Melvin Hawkeye Myers was killed eight days later in heavy fighting action near Sainte Maria Glaze. His family later learned that he was responsible for rescuing a fellow soldier. I remember when uh, they came to notify Grandma. Uh, I was just, uh, I was just a little guy, and, uh, you know, she uh, took it hard. I can still see his face, and uh, he, brought, <clears throat> he brought me a little paratrooper, I still have it. Private Eli Hosatosevit was with the 634th Tank Destroyer Unit and fought in the nine-week bloody battle against the Germans through the hedgerow country of France after D-Day. Private Ben Trevino served as a medic in the 60th Regiment of the 9th Infantry Division. They were both involved in the same battle. Private Hosatosevit was killed in action on August 1, 1944. Private Trevino died from shrapnel wounds two days later on August 3, 1944, only two days before his 22nd birthday. Well, when they got her telegram from the government that my, ben, my brother Benny had got killed over there, and then she was never was the same her anymore. And uh, all she done was cried and cried for him. Private First Class Thomas Chakpoya was serving at the same time with the 83rd Infantry Division. They were engaged in a fierce battle to capture the town of saint Malo. He was killed in action on August 7th, two days before the city was finally captured. Private First Class Gilbert Vidania was with the 4th Infantry Division and several weeks after D-Day he participated in the fierce battle for saint Lo, which finally fell to the Allies on July 18th. His unit eventually helped to liberate Paris on August 25th. On September 16, 1944, 
He was killed in action along the German defense barrier known as the Siegfried Line. His division was the first ground force to enter Germany. His two brothers, Herbert and Albert, both fought in the European theater but survived the war and later fought in Korea. The last Comanche to be killed in combat action in Europe was Private Henry Dutch Cosachata, who served with the 148th Engineer Combat Battalion. He was killed by a sniper on May 1, 1945, only seven days before Germany surrendered. The only Comanche to lose his life in action in the war in the Pacific was Private First Class Henry Conwoop, who served in the 25th Infantry Division and fought with MacArthur to retake the Philippine Islands. After taking back three towns on the island of Luzon, Private Conwoop was killed by shrapnel on May 23, 1945. He is forever 23 years old. Several Comanches served in the Army Air Forces as combat bomber pilots and navigators. Lieutenant Colonel Meech Tasikwa was a B-24 pilot involved in a highly secret mission to make the first bombing strike on Japan. The bombing group known as HALPRO flew 13 B-24s from Florida to Brazil and then across the Atlantic to Africa. Their intended destination was a small Chinese airstrip within bombing range of Tokyo. When the group left, there were no ground bases in Africa to service B-24s, and there were no navigational charts available. By the time they reached Egypt, their original destination in China had been overrun by the Japanese, so the mission had to be altered. Instead of bombing Japan, the decision was made to bomb the oil refineries of Ploesti in Eastern Europe. On June 11, 1942, their 13 B-24s flew overnight from Egypt to make the historic first U.S. Air Force bombing mission in the European theater. The B-24's fuel consumption prevented them from returning all the way to Egypt and many were forced to crash land in Turkey and Syria after the bombing run. Their group later became the 376th bomb group based in North Africa. Major Vincent Myers was a B-25 navigator bombardier serving in the 12th Air Force in North Africa. He was one of three brothers who served in different branches of the military. Vincent and his brother Melvin, who served in the infantry, were also accomplished boxers. Dad fought Melvin three times when they were Golden Gloves boxers, and they said that that was one of the best fights that they had ever seen when Dad and Melvin fought. And I think Vincent just let Melvin whip him. I don't think uh, Vincent, uh, Melvin could be <laughs> whip Vincent. I know a story about Vincent when he went into the military, and he was stationed at uh, Midland, Texas. They had a, a, a sergeant that, you know, was in charge of the recruits. And they, they, they were recruits. This sergeant was a kind of a cocky, cocky sort of a fellow, and I guess he was really giving them a bad time. So they matched a boxing match with him. They had boxing going on there, and oh, he could just whip anybody, you know. Mm -hmm. so, they got in the ring and Vincent knocked him out. <laughs> right before deployment, the three brothers returned to their farm to see their mother, Lena. I can remember, uh, I think it was, I was about three, but I remember him coming by and we had a, a big uh, hedge. There was opening, they come walking through. Vincent flew over 71 combat missions and served as lead navigator bombardier for the 488th Bomber Squadron. On March 14, 1944, his crew flew the famous bombing mission over Monte Cassino, Italy, in support of U.S. Army troops who were tied down by heavy German defenses. His pilot later said that his ability to hit a difficult target was unequaled. 
He received the Distinguished Flying Cross for his gallantry in effectively bombing a railroad bridge in Orvieto, Italy, after their B-25 received a direct hit from anti-aircraft fire and was badly damaged and difficult to control. Captain Myers Wani served as a pilot of a B-24 with the 448th Bomb Group in seething England. His airplane, named Comanche, was shot down on its 18th combat mission over Brussels, Belgium. Captain Wani was wounded in the ankle by flak, but was able to get himself and his crew out in time to parachute to safety. Captain Wani and eight crew members were captured on March 24, 1944 and were held as prisoners of war for the next 15 months. Then, then they got hit and then he had to, he was flying and he said he had to keep the plane straight so that they could bail out. He said, when he said, well, you guys are going to have to bail out because we're going to go down. And, he's, and he says, he can't bail out. And he said, why can't you bail out? And he said, I don't have a parachute. And he said, where's your parachute? And he said, it's at the other end of the plane. Apparently, he left it somewhere here in the tail. So he had to walk to the back and get his parachute, and then he jumped. Apparently, Dad stayed with the plane as low as it could go before he could jump. And Stuart said he was yelling at him to jump, and he, then he said he would jump, but he had to take care of some of the stuff. So he was destroying papers and breaking stuff, I guess, within the plane. Several Comanches suffered the cruelties and hardships of being held as a prisoner of war. None suffered more than the Americans that were taken captive by the Japanese in the Philippines. Staff Sergeant Bruce Kleinkohl was part of a coastal artillery unit in the Philippines when the Japanese attacked on December 6, 1941, six hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor. The highly outnumbered U.S. forces fought fiercely for four months, but with no possible way of supplies or reinforcements to come in, they were forced to surrender. Those who survived the fighting faced a brutal and cruel captivity. They were marched in what was later called the Bataan Death March. The wounded and weak were shot by the Japanese, and the rest were beaten and slowly starved. Between 6,000 and 11,000 prisoners died during these three years of brutality, starvation, and disease at the hands of the Japanese. Staff Sergeant Kleinkohl was held from April 9, 1942 until September 1, 1945, three years and four months, and he survived to return home. If you got tired and couldn't go no far and you fell down, you got bayoneted right there, he pulled off a shot. Uh, 60 to 70 miles we had to go clear up to this. Uh, I think they called it uh, San Fernando. Well, that's where they set us for the first concentration bunch there. And that was the worst one that could ever happen because they had uh, tried to separate the well from the sick. They had enough barracks there, so these, when they were sick was over here, there was a little place open there, we had to stay on this side here. And then they had the burial details, what they call burial details. Those guys that were had passed away might still be just laying there. It wasn't just two or three, and I mean there were hundreds of them over there that were sick. And they, you go through a lot of you know experience, and you get over there to the uh, burial over the head. They were just a mm, probably about the size of this room here, the length, about maybe 12 feet wide, maybe about that deep. Dump the bodies and cover them up. That's all there was. There was no uh, you know funeral. They said, well, let's have a funeral. Even the chaplain, I don't think, was allowed to go. They just kept them and dump them and turn around and go on back. So there was a lot of them left like that over there in a burial covering or so I crawled in there. I said, well, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go right here. I'm going to just die here. That was my only time that I really, you know, just say I'm giving up. Well, I was in there, then this white guy come by here. And he's from New Mexico, but he said, what are you doing in there? I said, I don't feel good. Well, come on out, get on out of here. He said, let's go back up to the barracks here and find you a place up there. Well, he saved my life, in other words. I mean, he, he made me get out of there. So I, from that time on, I said, well, okay, I'm going to make it. Well, that was one of my, you know, only time that I recall it. I just about, you know, give it up. I said, 
there's no way that it's going to stop this dysentery. Uh, it's it's going to get worse. And then they came up with the idea, well, when they get through cooking, uh, we'll scrape the bottom of these big uh, vats. We can scrape that out and that burnt rice, give it to you guys to eat. They said, that, that should be able to slow that up, and it did. I don't know how come it did, but that was one of the, <laughs> the medicines that they made and come to mind in the, in the prison camp. On December 16th, the Germans mounted their final counteroffensive against the Allies in the Battle of the Bulge. For Americans, this was the bloodiest battle of the war in Europe, with heavy casualties on both sides. Over 10,000 Allied troops were killed and 48,000 wounded. It was here that Private First Class Samuel Doc Piwawarty and Corporal Samuel Trevino who served with the 106th Infantry Division, were captured by the Germans and held as prisoners of war until war's end. I never forget about it. I, I never told my story to anyone. I never did tell it because it hurts me. But I got real scared when I saw my comrades out there, blood all over, all over the ground. So who, who knows, I could have been next. But the good Lord saved, decided to save me, I guess. All through my POW, that would intim intimidate us. You'd be scared, sometimes you can't hardly sleep. During our march, something couldn't make it. So they were shot. My brother Sam was captured. He was in a cave, he said, he told us. And uh, he got in that cave, and the other three boys that was with him, they went on around the mountain, because it was a mountain. He was hid in that cave. One of them happened to turn around and look back, and they seen him in that cave. And they ordered him out of there. When he come out, they asked him if he was an American Indian. He said yes. So they took him on. He said he never seen the like of young men that they had got. And they was uh, walking on, marching them on, going on. And uh, all of a sudden, that they ordered them to stop. And they shot two of the boys said that boys were scared to death, and then German just shot them right the side of them. Sergeant Cloyd Goody was a ball turret gunner on a B-17 heavy bomber named Fort Worth Gal. He flew with the 381st Bomb Group out of Ridgewell in England. On September 10, 1944, they were shot down over Baden-Baden, Germany. He was able to parachute to safety, but was held as a prisoner of war until war's end. He said when he got up, up on, you know, the main part of the ship, well, he said they got ready to, uh, everybody had already bailed out. And he said he was standing at the doorway, and he told this one guy, I don't know what he did, but uh, he told him, come on, let's go. And so he jumped out, and and then after he jumped out, I don't know how far he, down he was, he said that the uh, plane exploded. He said when he came down, they captured him. Um, he said then they uh, put him in these uh, boxcars. He said, they're telling me that uh, they was packed in there like sardines. Thing was happening. The SS officers would just walk through the line and take guns and just point them to the heads of the officers and pull the triggers. And he said the guy. He said it was just random. Whoever was there would get shot. And when he said that he was standing there, and uh, the guy next to him, they shot the guy next to him. He was part of that group that helped him escape, but he himself wouldn't go because he said that he couldn't, he wouldn't go. They wanted him to go, and he said he didn't want to go. He said I can't go, and and they didn't. They wanted to know why he didn't want to go, and he said I'm not the same color as you are. I would be easy to spot. And the interesting part of what he told me was that <clears throat> the German people asked him very pointed question, why are you fighting us? And my cousin told him, if, if I were not here fighting, you would have probably already been to the United States 
and you would have defeated us and you would have taken our land. We have already had our land taken before. I don't want it taken again. With the dropping of two atomic bombs on Japan came a sigh of relief for both the troops and those at home as the war came to an end. Brutal, costly eastern half of the most horrible worldwide war in human history is now within minutes of ending for good. General MacArthur speaks. We are gathered here, representatives of the major warring powers, to conclude a solemn agreement whereby peace may be restored. Just thankful that how many people they say the American people, you know. It was just bears that right there where they dropped that bomb. They went right to the top of that hill. And on the other side, it was just nice and green. And on both sides in that valley, it just whooped all that out. Right down, all the way down the end. And that submarine factor there, it just twisted it like a tornado and a fire hit it together. Us in California fixing to go back, really? going back overseas when they dropped the bomb. And everything went crazy in California. Everybody was giving you beer and trying to kiss you. <laughs> the most vivid memory I have of that, of that war was uh, it was a summer day and, and I was out riding my horse. And I heard the siren and surreal start blowing, which didn't do anything to alarm me. But it kept blowing, it kept sounding, just on and on. And, and, and I rode back to the house and went in and asked my mother, uh, mother, Mama, why, why is that siren still going? And she said, well, the war is over. With the end of World War II, the entire Comanche community came together and experienced a renewed sense of pride and dignity as the warriors returned and were honored for their bravery and service to the nation. The traditional homecoming celebrations became a major part of the healing process. Big gathering, only one that gathered was my grandmother and she had some visitors here in Oak Oak. I remember coming home that evening. Yeah, my, my favorite dog, well, he recognized me. And hell, he, I think that dog crawled about 50 yards. Started licking my feet. And, and my grandmother saw me and Start Lulu and the others did too, and boy, they, they come around, danced around me, and patted me. Some got dirt, put it over them, all over. And, and they had a big feast, and uh, they danced, and they had that peyote meeting. You, st you would sit in there all night, and the next morning we had a big feast, and. Uh, all my kinsfolks was there, Kiowas and Comanches, you know. The best thing I remember was when I was uh, discharged and I came home. And uh, I was carrying my little bag and, and I was coming up the road to the mission where it was. Then all of a sudden I saw my old, my old aunt came out and she, she got the talking. I couldn't believe it. Somebody got the talking for me. And she, she came and then she started singing a song. I had never heard it before. The song she was singing was the Warrior's Return song. I said, for me? I don't deserve it. I told my mother, I said, stop her, stop her, because I don't deserve this. And my mother said, be quiet. Let her do what she wants to. I'm an old man now and survived the Great Depression in the 20s and 30s, I guess. I survived that and 
In the World War Two, I survived that. And being married 60 years, I survived that. Spiritual traditions and beliefs that had their origin long before Christian contact and influence have continued to have importance for warriors from all tribes. Items that have special significance or that are believed to possess special powers are often carried into battle in a small medicine pouch worn around the neck. Inside that, that medicine pouch that I talked about, it was, it was, a, uh, it was a little peyote in there, uh, some crumb, crumbled up peyote, and a little cedar in there. And if I'm not mistaken, it's a, a, what they call a, that perfume, the Indian perfume it was put in there. It's a little bit old, but that's the only thing that I took with me from them that uh, I carried with me at all times, you know. And, uh, I want to tell everybody, it worked. Captain Myers Wani told family members after the war that when he was getting ready to go on what turned out to be his last bombing mission, he couldn't find his medicine bundle and flew without it. He felt that flying without it made him vulnerable. He knew that something was going to happen because of his, the medicine wasn't there. So he kind of made arrangements with himself that he, you know, to that something was going to happen to him. Most of us what had peyote on. I had four dry peyote around my neck. Old man, money touch your Edgar's daddy. Mm -hmm. Put it down. He could take you over there and bring you back. You get fear. You something wrong. He said, break one off, dry one, take big piece of it, chew it. While you're doing that, he said, talk to my thick one. Talk to the Creator. He can take care of you. Some also wear traditional emblems that are believed to possess the power to protect the warrior and even provide special capabilities. The eagle feather has always had a great significance in the Comanche culture. In a book written by a Marine in his unit, Eddie Masit is described in combat in the jungles of Vietnam. The writer described a nighttime battle and how he recognized Eddie fighting hand-to-hand -hand with several North Vietnamese soldiers by the silhouette of the eagle feather that Eddie wore on his helmet. So I know that the prayers that were said for me brought me back home. I was never wounded of the two tours. Uh, and once uh, in my first tour we were overran and then twice during my second tour where our position was overran. Uh, once we were overran four times and that was, that was, uh, I fought hand to hand then at that time. You know, every time I went overseas, my grandmother would take me in her bedroom and she'd pull out her little, well, I don't know what it was, I always had her back to me. And she would pray for me and she would mark me up here, I know for sure, and it was her medicine and always came back. And I think about some of the times, especially in Vietnam and Korea, because it was hot over there. It was a hot war. It was a shooting war in the 60s, too. Uh, I think about some of the situations that I was in, uh, and I can name at least a half a dozen where I could have been seriously injured or even killed, but I wasn't. And I always attribute that to my grandmother and her prayers. The grandma would get up and put the flag up every morning and sing. She would be crying. Now Yaki got Numuhubia Tunakwit until he came home. They had a peyote meeting for him. They did a lot of things for him and gave him little medicine bags to take and she would do that every morning and every evening. It was just a few years after the end of World War II that Comanche tribal members once again answered the call to fight in Korea. Communist nations were beginning to invade neighboring countries, and the UN and President Truman saw this as a threat to world peace. Hostilities began as North Korean forces began to invade South Korea. During both World War II and the Korean War, many Comanches served with the 45th Infantry Division. Also, World War II and Korean, one of the most uh, decorated, highly decorated infantry divisions was the 45th Infantry Division which uh, I believe it's the 178th Infantry. They had one whole comp company C was made up mostly of uh, Indians from around here, highly decorated, and uh, they served uh, with honor. When the 45th left for Korea, Rusty Wakini was only 16 years old. 
I think I celebrate my 17th birthday in Japan. We we were getting ready to load on the train there in Indarco. That's when they had a rail going through there then. So we marched from the army and then we went toward the train station. I mean, I mean people were all, all around there. And this is where this old man, uh, Jimmy Anku, he sang this 45th Division song. See, it's, and, uh, the way I understand the words say they're going over there. And we want them to be safe because we want them to come back home safe. You know? and when, they, when they first left, it's just uh, the sound of the women. When they, uh, they made the sound of Lulu, it just, it just went through your body. You could feel it. In all, 136 Comanches served during the Korean War. It was fought in extreme weather conditions against a determined enemy. We lived in holes like rats. When we got up there, it's 45 below zero. Can you imagine that, 45 below zero? The last, the last week and two weeks in November, it was 52 below. Yeah, I think anybody tell you, 40 below zero is what, 41, somewhere in that area. Uh, and it was cold, all right, like I say, uh, I was talking about uh, on this river that these tanks were coming across. Okay, when they when we hit the target and they say far for effect, everybody shoot. And that, you used to talk about that, that river being so frozen up that then tanks were coming across, see. And uh, that's why I say we got we got, uh, they give us that, well, you got the first tank, but the rest of them got the other one, you know, and so they give us a tank and a half on We got to paint it on our weapon. Because when I got on the other side, I could hold my goddamn head up. I come through this son of a bitch with flying colors. And I had 10 guys behind me. I had to take care of, never lost the one while I was there with them. Corporal Dennis King Carty served with Company B, 1st Battalion, 38th Infantry Regiment. He was severely wounded and captured during the infamous May Massacre. On May 18, 1951, Corporal Carty's unit became totally surrounded by Chinese troops and short of ammunition, they suffered heavy casualties and were eventually overwhelmed by swarms of Chinese soldiers. According to a survivor of the battle, Carty was wounded several times resisting capture. He eventually died from his wounds while being held as a prisoner of war. They was captured and they took him, took him into that camp, camp four, I think, what it was. That, uh, that's where he was when he died. They said he died of pneumonia, but that guy was talking about he was there when he died. He, he had pneumonia, but he died because of his wounds. He didn't take care of him. The, the battle, in, in, uh, it's called the Battle of Chosen Reservoir, is what it's called. It was a constant battle, you know. You could, it, 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 there was not a front line. You could just fire all the way around you, and, and it was Chinese. There were 17 Medal of Honors awarded for that three-week period. Uh, I, I've had so many good friends that their life was snuffed out because of personal sacrifice, doing things way beyond the call of duty to, to protect, to save, and, and uh, uh, their, their, their comrade, their, their, their fellow man. Lieutenant Colonel Meech Tasikwa, who had distinguished himself as a pilot in World War II, also flew combat missions in Korea but was killed in the crash of a B-26 in which he was a passenger. The crew bailed out, but his body was never found. After the Korean War, America experienced a time of relative peace and great prosperity. It was also a time of a new type of warfare, a war that was not openly fought with conventional weapons. America's new threat was the Soviet Union, whose leader Khrushchev had said, we will bury you. This was the beginning of the Cold War. A number of Comanches served in the U.S. military during this time. 
I was stationed at Land Air Force Base in Fairbanks, Alaska. I was a crew chief on the F-89s, and this was during the Cold War with Russia, and we we kept uh, four airplanes on uh, constant 24-7 uh, alert. If uh, there was an airplane that uh, strayed across what they called the dew line, that uh, we would scramble on them, and they and the pilots would uh, go out and identify uh, the airplane, what it, whatever it was. I was stationed in northern, northern Canada at a remote uh, radar site, and it, it was only three, three radar stations out in, that belonged to the United States that were in Canada, and I was on one of them. In radar, you, you see these little blips, and, and you, you send out a signal for them to identify themselves, and they, if they do not identify themselves, and you see the blip moving at approximately 500 miles per hour, you know it's not a jetliner, uh, you know it's some other type of aircraft. So we, we, uh, we have our standard operations a requirement to, to call, pick up the red phone, and scramble military aircraft. And by the time the aircraft get to, to almost to the polar cap, the blip turns around and goes back wherever it came from. So they were always testing the adequacy and efficiency of, of our, of our um, radar. In the early 1960s, President John F. Kennedy committed American forces first in an advisory role to Vietnam, a country in Indochina with a long violent history. Communist guerrillas were trying to use force to overthrow a young democratic government in South Vietnam. The advisory role that Americans played was short-lived, and soon American troops were called up in large numbers to fight a brutal 10-year jungle war. 279 Comanches enlisted to serve in the battle. We were taking, uh, they were taking incoming motors on the air, airstrip and everything, and I seen these Vietnamese people running all over the place, you know, and I said, oh my gosh, I ain't even got a gun yet. You know? Basically, I was trained to be a radio man. But uh, the job I had was, like I said, uh, calling in airstrikes. I was responsible for um, getting people out that got wounded. You had two seasons, a wet and dry season. That was it. There was no in-betweens. It didn't really get cold, but it got hot, hot and humid. And then when it got hot, it would just walk, you just walking in dust, like powdered sugar. And then just opposite, when it rained, it was always in mud. Comanche warriors distinguished themselves in the tradition of the Pukutsi and fought the enemy with reckless disregard for their own personal safety. You know, we was in a rubber plantation going through it and we got ambushed. And the last thing I remember was picking up a tree that uh, RPG went over and blew up and went over my head and blew up and fell down and broke my 50 off its mount. So I threw the tree off and put my 50 in the bustle rack that's the last thing I remember. But in the jungle, I knew where I was. I could see things, hear things, even smell things, you know. And the biggest part that I thought was contributed was from some of my grandmother's teachings. And, you know, just a little bit of learning what tracks were there, what to look for, what is there that shouldn't be, you know, those things. I think I helped keep a lot of uh, others alive. We've seen a lot of action. Um, times where there was a medevac chopper went down in front of us and there was so much fire, you know, he, he couldn't help but get hit, but, you know, through our Lord, our Creator, you know, we went out and we pulled these guys back and brought them back to safety. Life is precious and boy, when you see someone that you've just talked to and he's laying there in front of you and he's lifeless, oh man, mm -hmm. that really makes you think about it. That's what I got when I was telling you earlier about I didn't graduate, I thought I was too smart, I knew it all. Uh, when I got over there and had them bullets flying over my head and stuff, I used to think about how you, all I had to do was go to school, sit on my butt, and learn, you know, and just listen and learn. And there I was over there with bullets flying around your head, and you don't think about those things until it's right there, you know. Like, and they tried to come right through my platoon, and uh, during the course of the fight, my, uh, I took a round and my, uh, my M16 was shot out of my hand. It was inoperable. I didn't have any weapons other than a knife, and a uh, knife was a K-bar. And uh, all of a sudden, here comes uh, three NVA soldiers came, coming right at me, and I thought, that's it, I'm, I'm a goner, I'm finished. 
and I pulled my knife and, uh, and uh, jumped the first one that came through there. But luckily, one of the other guys in my position who happened to be my uh, radio telephone operator, he, he offed the other two. And uh, then I picked up one of the rifles that those NVA soldiers dropped. I used that one for a while until I was able to uh, get an M16. And I was in midair when it hit me, you know? And it hit me, and it hit me through here, broke my jaw here, shattered here, through here, knocked my eyeball way in the back. I had my helmet on, cause man, the grenades were all going up. I had my strap on like this, had my helmet down tight. It hit my helmet, stuck to my helmet, into my skin. I couldn't take my helmet off because it was stuck in my helmet and my head, and my skin. It, it threw me back over the, I must have took about four or five somersaults. But here they come. And the guy must have thought I was dead. Cause they stepped over me, a couple of guys stepped over me. I had a 45 and I laid it like this. And here come the guy with a bayonet. And he looked, he come down like this and I'm looking up and his eyes got that big. I boom, I dropped him. And I was one of the walking wounded, they call it walking wounded. And all I wanted, I said, give me something, give me something, you know. I wanted the M16, M14, you know, because I know they're going to break through again. I stayed like that all night long. They couldn't get a medevac in there, you know. The sun came out, we had the jets come in with napalm, with 500-pound bombs. They dropped them, boom, 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 boom. You lay on the ground like this, they tell everybody to get down. And you lay down like this, and it hit so bad and so close, it'll pull your breath out of your mouth. And it, it'll bring you off the ground, boom, like this, you know. And plus, the, 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 the concussion will suck the breath out of your, out of your mouth. You feel like somebody's choking, you know. And it was that close, because they were that close. And then they dropped that napalm all around the circles like this. And that was the only thing that saved us. Two Comanche warriors did not return from battle. Private First Class Russell Eugene Piswanet served in the U.S. Marine Corps. On July 22, 1966, shortly after a day-long firefight, his unit was assigned to climb a hill and set up a listening post. As night fell, they came under attack from a large contingent of North Vietnamese who were concealed in tunnels all around their position. He was killed by small arms fire. He was 19 years old. Corporal Robert Carlos Pachica, who also served in the U.S. Marine Corps, was killed on October 22, 1968. He was on a routine patrol in Quang Nam Province when his unit encountered a North Vietnamese tunnel complex. During the fierce battle that followed, Corporal Pachica was mortally wounded when a satchel charge exploded. A friend carried him to an aid station and thought his wounds were only minor, but he died a few minutes later. He had only been in Vietnam for two months. He enlisted in the Marine Corps uh, right shortly after I enlisted in the Marine Corps, and he went to Vietnam before me, and he was only in Vietnam for a, a short time when uh, I got orders to Vietnam, and I came home to visit my, uh, my grandmother and grandfather in, in Indiahoma, and uh, it's at that time that my grandmother told me that Robert Carlos had been killed, he'd been killed, uh, I was here in uh, November and had been killed in October of 68. And so my grandmother really had a hard time uh, when I was visiting and, and she, uh, she was quite uh, broken up that I was going to Vietnam and she had already lost uh, uh, somebody over there. One of the most shameful chapters in American history was the public anger and disrespect directed at returning American soldiers. You returned and had your uniform on, you were shouted at, you were belittled, and in some instances spit on. So when I came home, there was the, the kids at San Francisco that had those white sheets on, they were bald-headed, I and mean, you know, the, uh, they spit on me. They, uh, they spit at me, let's put it like that. If they spit on me, I probably would have attacked them. But. Uh, they spit at me, called me baby killer and all this, and these were the kind of homecomings that we got when we came home. And uh, there was no ticket tapes, no parades, no like When I got out, I was bitter. I was, you know, upset. You know, I didn't have no homecoming, you know? But when I got out, I just let it go. We had a problem with drinking, had a problem with drugs and all that. The wounds of war are not always visible. Combat veterans always carry with them the inner scars, the memories of the horrors, that are relived in dreams and flashbacks. Now, to this day, I have problems sleeping. I never sleep all night. I wake up one, two, three, four times. I'm always looking, uh, scanning. 
Some feel guilt, not for what they were required to do in the line of duty, but the guilt of being a survivor and the lingering question, why did I survive when my friends didn't? I look at myself as more of a warrior than a veteran. And I say that because I've fought hand to hand. I know that I've killed my enemy. There's a part that that has happened in my life that, you know, few can say and maybe won't happen. You know, like, maybe for a long time to come. But I tasted my enemy's blood. My enemy's blood blinded me during that time. There's not too many people that want to be able to say that. You know, so. These tears, I guess, kind of like, you know, tears of appreciation, prayers. You know, our Creator, He brought me home. And through all the things that, you know, I had been through. It is said that American Indian veterans seem to have suffered less from post-traumatic stress than others, largely because of the admiration and approval they received from their Indian communities. When you returned to the Indian world, you were honored. You were, not, you were honored not because of the po political aspects of the war, but because uh, you were a warrior then. You had earned your, uh, your place in our society. I came back, my mother and father put a, had an honoring powwow for me. The turnout was tremendous. It really uh, made me proud and I know it made my mother and father extremely proud to, to have that many people turn out to uh, uh, honor me coming back. It felt good. Uh, you know, that, that's, I guess that's how I, I coped with all that. The other home, when I got to San Francisco and all that, you know, I was mad. But Indian people make you feel good. Traditional warrior homecomings were the beginning of a slow healing process, a process that continues through annual veteran celebrations. But when I, when I got back here a few years ago, I was introduced to Lanny, and he made me feel, hey, he made me see a totally different concept of uh, the warriors and made me feel very proud of what I've done. Women have also had an important role in the warrior tradition. Forty-five Comanche women have served in the United States military at various times during the 20th century. Roberta Bradley was one of the first Comanche women to serve. She served with the United States Marines during World War II. I guess I was a little bit adventurous. I thought there was something I could do even if I, whatever. I carried messages and cor uh, correspondence from I don't know where they were. I had to be cleared. I guess I looked like I was inconspicuous and kind of didn't look like I would uh, be important. Linda Asnap served as a nurse during World War II in the Women's Army Corps. She was with the invasion forces in France and later earned the rank of lieutenant while stationed in England. Eleanor Otovich McDaniel served in the U.S. Army in the Persian Gulf War. She became the first Comanche woman to serve in a combat role with the U.S. military. I have three brothers. Uh, that served in the military and growing up I used to listen to their stories of their time in the military, where they traveled and, and the things they had done and to me it was very adventurous. I was a part of the uh, 13th Support Command and our job out there was to provide support to the front lines, anything from beans, toilet paper to Patriot missiles. 
that's what we provided. That was the support that we provided. Uh, it was water, it was ammunition, it was food, it was clothes. Uh, all of that had to be moved forward. So uh, we were right behind the front line. At this time in Comanche military history, Specialist McDaniel is the most decorated Comanche female soldier. Rhonda Williams has served in the United States Army since 1994. In 2005, she earned the rank of Major. She was also engaged in a combat role while stationed in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia in the War on Terrorism. It was fast, it was furious, and um, a lot of growing had to take place. And um, being exposed to a, a combat environment, uh, being exposed to a joint environment, um, there was a lot of growing that took place and it was just you know, something that had to happen. Saddam fired uh, several SCUDs and cruise missiles and my unit um, shot down three of the nine TBMs that um, our air defense um, takes credit for. I went into the Air Force in June of 1988. I'm a tribal member, I'm enrolled as a Comanche, and uh, the w whole warrior aspect did come into mind. Being in the military, uh, I'm not afraid, you know, to uh, stand up and acknowledge myself as a veteran. Um, I'm, I'm proud of that. I think it makes my family proud. I think it makes the tribe as a whole uh, proud. 33 Comanches have served in combat roles in the Persian Gulf War that was fought in response to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1991. In March 2003, American forces were once again called back into action in Iraq after Iraq defiantly broke their surrender agreements. We actually went just to south, I think it was the southeast of Baghdad area into a place called Saddam City and our battalion stayed there and secured that area while uh, the whole, that's when the news media had received word that they pulled down the statue of Saddam Hussein and everything. We were securing a small southeast part of the city. Having been to war was an accomplishment for me because that really define who I was as a Comanche member in the, in, in the tribe. Corporal Joshua Gerald Ware served with the U.S. Marine Corps. During his second tour of duty in Iraq, he and four other Marines were killed by terrorists while trying to clear a farmhouse. After being mortally wounded, he continued to fight. His actions allowed two other wounded Marines to be pulled from the farmhouse. The motivation to be a warrior is driven by an individual's sense of duty, responsibility, and devotion to their own people, a selfless disregard for one's own safety, and an unwillingness to watch as others fight the battle. I wanted to be a Marine, and I always say that, you know, Comanche, God made me Comanche, then he made me a Marine. Uh, I, I, I like those honors to me, that's the two greatest honors I could have. During the American wars of the 20th and early 21st century, 13 Comanches paid the supreme price and gave their lives for freedom. It is to these men that we owe a debt of gratitude and honor. They did not return as heroes they did not receive a homecoming celebration. Most of them never knew marriage or had children. They only had their youth.